Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to this uh, chess postmortem video. This is a postmortem of a slow game I played recently. This was played uh, in on ICC in the 45-45 uh, pool. So that's a uh, time control where you get 45 minutes for the game and uh, 45 seconds for each move. So that's uh, quite a lot of think time you can put into the game. Gives you some nice uh, quality games. Now uh, you do have to uh, have a lot of <laughs> enough time at least to uh, finish the game before you start it so make sure you've got a block of a couple hours uh if you think um the game will last 60 moves for example that would, uh, would be an hour and a half for each side for or three hours for the game if they used up the full time control now they don't usually the games don't usually go that long but it is a possibility if you want to play that pool you have to allow for that um so it's it's similar to an over the board time control, maybe not quite as slow, but but still allowing a good long time for uh, thinking about the moves and leading to some uh, pretty good quality chess. In many cases, of course, there's always uh, mistakes as usual. <laughs> Even with more time to think, you still make mistakes. Um, so my opponent had a rating here of uh, 1778, and my rating was 1591. Now the the ratings are different in each pool. So in the five minute pool, I have a rating of about 1400. In the 15-minute uh, pool, my rating is uh, over uh, 1,600. And in the standard pool, my rating is uh, over 1,800. So I was thinking um, that at 1,591, I'm probably underrated for this pool. But uh, that's just a trend. That's not a guarantee. Each, each uh, rating pool is, is really separate and uh, independent in theory. So, so there's no reason <laughs> that I should think that particularly. But, uh, but I still think that uh, I'm probably underrated for this pool, uh, just based on the trend. So... Um, my opponent played e4 here, and I countered with uh, d5, the center counter or Scandinavian defense. Um, this is one of my main defenses. I, I play, I guess, uh, my top choices are uh, e5 and c5, and then uh, recently I've added e6 and uh, d5, the French defense and the Scandinavian defense, as uh, uh, defenses that I play uh, even in over-the-board games. And... Um, it, it gives uh, black uh, some interesting uh, positions. I think uh, it opens it up a little bit, so you're you're not going to be stuck in some closed maneuvering game if you don't want to uh, play one of those. And um, <clears throat> it, it may uh, discomfort the uh, the e4 player who's uh, maybe not as used to these positions as he is to the e4, e5, or the Sicilian or the French positions. He may be more comfortable playing those. This leads to some positions that are similar to a queen's pawn openings in, in many ways. So um, the way for um, white to try for an advantage here is to play e takes d5. And white, in fact, does have a, a slightly bigger edge here than he does in those other openings, which is why it's not quite as popular. But it's still quite a playable opening for black. Now, I, I play the uh, knight f6 line. The other line is to um, take the pawn with the queen, and then the queen usually gets kicked over here and then... then comes back here a lot of times after playing c3. So uh, I thought, uh, you know, why, why, why do that with the queen? Why not just bring the knight out and try and recapture that way? Uh, if white tries to defend the pawn with the move c4, you can undermine with uh, c6 or e6, and it is uh, it is a gambit, but it's a good gambit for black, so uh, advantage to black in those lines. So d5 here is the main move, and it's the best move. Um, knight takes d5 and knight f3. So these are all very typical moves, bishop g4. Um, the other way to play is with the move g6 here. Um, but this is this is also very common. And then now my opponent played h3. Not a, not a bad move, but the most common move there is bishop e2. And now I could take, uh, retreat to h4 or go to f4. I chose here. Uh, the chess engine actually thinks taking is the best choice there. Um, and uh, maybe uh, h4 also is slightly better, keeping keeping the pressure on that knight keeping the pin. But I thought, oh, well, it might be interesting to try and get something going on this uh, diagonal towards c2. The knight, for example, is poised to jump into b4 and attack c2. So my opponent played a3, putting a stop to that plan. I go e6, opening up line for my bishop, and now bishop c4. So up until this point, if we back up, um, white's got uh, a pretty, pretty decent opening advantage, and the way to keep it is to play c4, or uh, bishop d3. Uh, with this move, maybe it's not, not the most precise move. It's in the way of the c-pawn, which uh, white generally wants to play and try and take more space. So I could ignore this uh, threat to exchange here. It's not really much of a threat. Uh, I just uh, 
could develop my bishop to d6 and let him trade there if he wants to. But I decided to play the knight with tempo, kick the bishop. And then um, I want to play for the move c5 to open up the center a little bit more and uh, get some space for my pieces. So I, I play uh, bishop e7 first. I want to castle. I want to prepare this move c5. I don't want to play it when uh, white can trade queens and cause me to lose my castling privilege. So white goes knight c3, I castle, white castles, and I play c5. Now, uh, taking is probably the best move I take. And now this line did open up, but it's not to anyone's advantage to trade. If white takes, um, I'll just get a rook there, and if I take, he just gets a rook there. So um, probably the queens are just going to sit there facing each other for a while. And um, the uh, oh, he could move the queen to the side, but he chose to play uh, bishop to f4. Now, uh, that's an interesting move. It takes control of this diagonal and keeps my queen out of c7, where I wanted to go. So I go knight c6, just continuing my development. And now he goes queen e2. So um, rook c8. So after this, um, things are, are pretty much... Uh, <clears throat> uh, I guess, uh, no, I was going to say it's pretty much equal, but the engine, after thinking about it, thinks that uh, white still has an edge here. So rook a d1, kicking my queen around, and now I played uh, queen f6, and uh, maybe queen e7 would have been a little bit better. But I was setting up a, uh, a trick here, uh, a tactic. I'm, I'm threatening his bishop in a way. His bishop is undefended. It's a loose piece. And so if I can move my bishop with tempo, then, then his bishop is going to be hanging. So I could play, for example, bishop takes c2, bishop takes, and then I take his bishop. So that's what I was thinking of. And I also was aware that he could play bishop g5, but I thought, well, queen g6 would be a safe square for my queen, for example, like this. And um, now he can't really play knight to uh, h4 to harass my queen because his bishop is hanging. And if he tries to defend the bishop in any way, then I can play the move h6 and attack the bishop that way. So uh, I wasn't worried about this position, but it turns out there's one good move for white here which is to go after my bishop. <laughs> I was thinking of him going after my queen. I didn't think of him going after my bishop. And this just doesn't have any good squares, and my only way out here is to uh, counterattack his bishop. And with some wiggling and squirming, it uh, turns out I can survive this. He can retreat the bishop, but now this pawn is pinned here, so he can't take my bishop right away, and I can throw in this move uh, h5 and try and uh, release the pressure this way. So... Uh, Anyway, with some wiggling and squirming, I don't lose, I don't actually lose material, but it's, it's a, an uncomfortable position and, and good for white. So luckily for me, my opponent missed that, and he also missed the uh, idea of the uh, attack on his bishop. So he played rook f1, and I play bishop to c2, and I didn't really think about this move long enough. Um, the other move I thought about um, but this move I played because I had sort of planned it ahead of time. I didn't really consider all the options that uh, white has here. But it turns out uh, after bishop g5, this is uh, a bit awkward for me. Um, if I just move my queen, you know, I'm losing my bishop. So I have to keep going forward. I take and I'm threatening his queen. So now both queens are hanging. Um, but he can take my bishop. And uh, now I have to save my queen. There's only one square. And so it looks like I should be okay. I've won the exchange and a pawn, but uh, it turns out, uh, with the aid of the computer, it turns out this is a pretty good position for uh, white. So somehow the activity of his pieces is, an, is enough compensation. So uh, let's go back to the game. I just thought that was an interesting sideline. And it, it's the kind of thing you should look for. Uh, maybe you know you, you get to the end of it and you decide, oh, it's no good because I'm down the exchange. But uh, you, know, you should always be on the lookout for these intermediate moves. So instead of just automatically recapturing, throw in an attack on the queen and see how far you can calculate. Okay, but he just took back and I grabbed his uh, bishop. And now um, I have a slight edge. It's not a full pawn because he has compensation in the form of better development and my pieces are a bit awkward. This little cluster on the queen side is a bit strange and my king side is a bit empty of pieces. So I just need to uh, reorganize and consolidate and uh, white should probably be playing actively to try and keep me from consolidating. So white played knight e4 here, went bishop e7, hitting my bishop, so chasing me around. And now bishop b1, maybe a bit of a waste. He, he wants to create a, a battery of queen and bishop, but he could have, um, if I back up for a second, he could have played queen 
to D3 immediately um, if he wanted to just set up that battery. But he sets that up in a second, so it just seemed like this was a bit of a wasted move. Bishop B1, I went uh, Knight D5 trying to get my pieces into the game, and he went Queen D3. So now this is the interesting point. Um, so there's obviously this threat here, and uh, it's important to notice that Knight to F6 does not defend. So hopefully you guys uh, are familiar with this tactic. He can just remove the defender with tempo. Knight takes there with check. And now I only have the three moves, four moves. I can take the, the knight. Yeah, four moves. I can take the knight with the queen, the bishop, or the pawn. But no matter how I take, he's just going to play queen takes h7 checkmate. Or if I move the king to uh, h8, still queen takes h7 is checkmate. So that is losing. So I have to play pretty cautiously here. Um... I was thinking for a bit about this move, um, knight to um, e5, counterattacking his queen. So if he moves with check here, uh, I can come in with the knight defending, and uh, now he can grab here. But uh, this would sort of hold together for me and, and be a good position, actually. But he has another move here which is uh, knight takes e5. And, uh, and also an interesting tactic. Um, if I take back with the queen, then he has knight f6 check. And uh, I can take here with the knight defending against the checkmate, but my queen is hanging. So, so it's a double attack. It's a threat of checkmate and a threat on my queen. And I can't deal with both of them. So... Uh, so I can't play any kind of adventurous move. I have to just play conservatively and defend. But this move g6 uh, turns out to be a, a, good, a good move. Uh, just stops all these uh, mating threats on the diagonal. Also notice he does not have a dark squared bishop. He's already traded that off. So I don't have as much of a worry about I mean, I have created dark squared weaknesses, but I have a dark squared bishop to defend them. So this is not too bad for me. So the game continues. Um, plays bishop a2 trying to create a weakness over here. Um, I support it. And then he played queen d2. So I thought this probably was a mistake. Um, up until this point, he had some compensation for the pawn, but after the queen trade, he's pretty much just down a pawn for not much. But the game goes on. I go king g7 to get off of this diagonal and uh, stay away. There are some potential uh, tricks, uh, tactics, uh, against e6 there and the fork of the king and the uh, rook with this bishop. So there are potential sacrifices on e6. So I get it up to a dark square away from the threats of his pieces. And um, he takes on d5, creating a weak pawn, so uh, or an isolated pawn, which, uh, which uh, white hopes will become weak, I guess. So he takes and I take. And so now we get to this position and knight c3 attacking my pawn. So here uh, is where I, I make a mistake. Uh, I really should just defend the pawn with rook to d8. And then he has time, you know, he can bring his rook over to attack it. Um, but I can push on with, um, let's see how this might go. So rook d8, rook d1. It says I can play bishop f6 here. I'm looking at an engine output. Now it seems like to me the pawn is hanging. If he takes the pawn, what happens? Bishop takes b2. Yeah, I get this pawn over here. And I'm threatening that pawn. So I guess this is okay. So I don't really need to um, defend that pawn per se. I just need to have some way of uh, getting a pawn in return for it. So. Uh, so he cannot, uh, cannot immediately win that pawn if I just defend it. So that's interesting. So starting with the rook, rook to uh, d8. I played instead the move d4, thinking I could uh, defend it indirectly. And I had calculated this uh, line where I thought he could go here. You know, it's a double attack because I've got a loose pawn. Um... Actually, it's not a double attack. I don't know why. What was I thinking? How about if I just uh, push here? And 
knight takes a7. Ah, uh, it is, in a way, it's a double of attack, because when the knight takes, uh, there, uh, so he's went a pawn that way. Okay, so that's that's the uh, point I was missing here, is that uh, this knight is, is, is overworked in this situation. He's defending here, and he's defending here. So knight b5, um, I was also thinking of the idea of just kicking the knight, so I'd he could still come here to a7, but it wouldn't uh, win any material. Um, but he can take here. And I thought, well, maybe I would trade and then play here. Yeah, so this is okay. This is okay. I would, I would get, my, um, get my pawn back. So that was the line I was thinking, but I missed something here, which is after I take, um, he can take here. <laughs> <laughs> because once again it's a problem of the overloaded piece so and I don't get my pawn back and now now this game is about even I can take on f3 and mess up his pawns and get an active rook but he has an active rook as well so uh, this would not be a this would be an even game basically so uh, so this move um, d4 that I played and I tried to calculate everything out I just uh, missed a few things when I was calculating the difference between me and an expert. <laughs> so uh, my opponent also had been thinking about the, these tactics. He had noticed that my knight was overloaded, and he just played knight takes uh, d4. And uh, that also seems to be pretty good. Not quite as good as the knight b5 line, though. Um, so now if I take the knight, um, then my bishop is hanging. But I have an alternative here which is to take on a3. So this is uh, another interesting tactic. Always keep your eye open for things like that. It's a desperado. Um, so rather than take the knight and give up the bishop, you know, uh, sacrifice the bishop for a pawn, and you're still going to get the knight. The thing is, um, if he moves this knight away, let's see, how about if he just retreats the knight? Then you take the pawn. So you're just a pawn or two up. So... Uh, and if he takes the bishop, then you take the knight. So uh, you're getting you're getting a piece either way. What he tried was knight takes c6, and then you take back with the rook. And once again, if he takes the bishop, you're taking the knight. So there's no uh, no way out, and we end up in this rook and pawn endgame. And I'm a pawn up. So I'm playing for a win. I can play on for quite a while pressing for the win. I don't really have any danger of losing. It's a pretty balanced position. I've just got a pawn up on the far side. But it is actually a hard position to win. The chess engine evaluation is, uh, you know, black is a pawn ahead or maybe slightly less, but it uh, doesn't give away to a, a win. And um, if you look in opening books, positions like these are sometimes winning and sometimes not, you know, so it all, all depends on the details. But you can play on for a long time and try to win. So I thought it's interesting to look at this and see, um, you know, some of the techniques you use in these rook end games and how you press for a win. Um, the other point is that table bases, table bases only go up to like six pieces. So that's uh, what we have here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So we are way, way, way outside the range of table bases. So, so in no way is this a simple technical. Uh, uh, end game. This is an end game you, you play on and uh, try, you know, as black, you've got the edge, so you play for the win and um, you just have to do the best you can. So white plays a good move here, just immediately activating his rook and attacking my pawn. Now I could just play rook takes a3 and let him take there, and we're going to end up um, in that similar kind of position, but I thought um, it was interesting here that I could throw in this check because it forces his king further away from the, where this pawn is going to queen. And that may turn out to be a crucial advantage later. And now I could either defend the pawn or I could go after the a-pawn. I said, well, let's, let's defend. And if white allows me, um, you know, I'm going to play the move uh, a6 and then b4. But uh, he stops that right away with the move a4. So now I can't play a6 because he would follow up with a5. I play a6, he plays a5, and then he's clamped down on my pawns and I really can never make any progress. So uh, at this point I have to switch tacks and go after the a-pawn here. So he takes, and uh, I take, 
And we get this simplified situation, which once again is not in your opening books. Uh, you can find similar positions in your opening books, but never exactly the same one. And uh, not clear if it's a win or a draw, but, but uh, black should try for the win. Um, the one thing they always tell you, of course, is that your rook belongs behind the passed pawn. So this rook should go here. But as you can see from the course of the game, it very often happens that your rook ends up in front of the passed pawn. And so you, you get these kind of positions quite a lot. I've had other openings with similar setups. So, so white tries to mobilize his king right away. I push the pawn, and he brings his king over. And now I bring my rook all the way back. My plan is to drive this pawn all the way forward. Um, now there's, there's sort of two plans here that you can have as um, black to try and win. One is to um, bring this pawn all the way forward and then at the last minute swing your rook over here to, uh, to uh, attack some of these weak pawns over here. The other thing you can try is you can try marching your king over this way to try and help that uh, pawn queen. Now if you're going to bring the king over you want this pawn to stop. You want your pawn to stop on this square, on a3, because the king wants to use this square to hide from checks from the white rook. If your pawn goes all the way forward, um, it has no shelter. So, uh, so you have to decide what's your plan. I chose instead to, uh, okay, what did black, white put his rook behind the pawn? Very logical. I chose the plan of marching the pawn all the way forward. Here. So now I'm not, I just didn't think I was going to be able to get my king over there. I, I don't know enough about this uh, ending to be sure that's the case, but uh, this was the plan I chose. Um, so in this position, you'll notice there's this, um, okay, so let, let's first of all talk about the king plan. So so with the pawn all the way up here, there's no. it's no good getting my king over there. Um, if we back up a bit, if I had stopped here and started to move my king in, you know, he can harass me with his rook. Now, that, that might have been a plan, too. Okay, so it's just a choice. You should probably try them both out in different, uh, different uh, games and see what works for you. Um, let's see. Let me, let me uh, do a few moves here. Just king here. See if I can get anywhere. Say he goes forward and tries to stop me from coming over. Can harass my king like this. Yeah, I think the combination of his active king and his rook is going to make it very difficult for me to make progress. So maybe the plan I chose was the correct one. So I chose this plan of uh, going all the way to a2. And now um, he can't be so free with his king. For example, if his king steps here, for, I can move my rook with check, and then the king can move forward to attack, but then I can queen. And when I queen, it defends my rook. And so that actually wins a whole piece. So uh, this is the one, one of the tactical, there's sort of two tactical ideas you have with this uh, pawn, this uh, pawn all the way to the second rank. So let's show the first one. The first one is this idea. If uh, black plays a move like that, white, if white plays a move like that, you can just check. And uh, this is just winning. Um, he can attack the, the rook. You go here, you queen, rook takes, rook takes, and you're a rook up. Okay, so very clear. He can't go there. Let's back up. Um, and the other idea shows up in this position. He actually moved king to d2. And I missed it here, but I could have played the move rook to f1. So the second tactic, the first tactic is just the check to buy a tempo for advancing the pawn. The second tactic is to take advantage of a skewer on this row, on the second row. So now when you move the rook away, you're always threatening to queen. So he's got to do something about that immediately. He has to take, and then you take here with check, and then the king gets out of the way, and then you grab the rook. So that would have been the simplest way to win this. So that's what I mean is you, you play on. So it turns out in this position, there's this gap. There's this gulf of these uh, three, three rows here where the white king has to cross to get to the pawn, and it's just too big. He can't if he was one square closer and he could get to this square, he might be close enough. But, but from where he is, he can never get to this pawn um, with his king. And that's what White's trying to do, is get to this pawn with his king and round it up. Um, 
so with best play he can't do that um, but if he just keeps his king over here um, between say f6 and e6 f3 and e3 um, I'm not sure how I make progress my plan was to uh, start pushing my pawns and seeing if I could try and create a breakthrough or create a Zugzwang where his king has no no squares to go to um, so that's how I continue to try to play for a win um, but my opponent played king d2 so here I could have played rook f1 and just one as I showed before but I didn't, didn't spot that idea at this point he played uh, I played king f6 instead um, you know just preparing this plan of moving my king forward and moving my pawns forward and then my opponent played uh, king to c3 and now I, I figured that this was winning so so this is kind of an instructive uh, pawn endgame win so first of all you throw in this check and the king can come all the way to b2 that's the difference when the king is close enough uh, where the check allows him to attack the pawn you're not winning uh, lots of material um, but the queen he takes you take he takes and what you get is just your better king position so this is a winning king and pawn endgame just because of the uh, king position and I'll just show how it played out from here without much more commentary um, so my turn yeah I went to e5 he went to b2 e4 just going after his pawns as quickly as possible and of course he wants to get some counterplay so he's going after my pawns he can't get over to defend in time so he's just got to go for it and now uh, it gets a little bit tricky he plays g4 and um, Oh, it looks like oh, the engine thinks I can play king to g2 anyway. I was I was a little worried about this, that he might be able to play this pawn forward, and now I can't uh, ever advance these pawns. But I guess I'm still fast enough. Ah, I guess this is a Zugzwang position. You just move your king to the side. And uh, he has to move away. There's no way he can go, nowhere he can go to to defend his pawn. So, and then obviously, I mean, Black could have taken that pawn. He can take both pawns. It doesn't matter. Your king is in front of your pawn, and you're winning. Okay. So that was a. I would have been a way to win too. I was a little bit worried about uh, this move. Uh, G. G4 to G5. So I played H5 to stop it. This is still winning. And um, he came in with his king bring my king in he did a trade brings his king in but I take the pawn and then um, there's just no way to stop this pawn from becoming a queen and my opponent finally resigned so that's uh, that's how it ended hope you guys uh, found that interesting um, and I will see you again soon oh leave any comments you have in the section below bye